core similarity is the same bargain that the Soviet people struck with the Communist Party. Yes, I recognize that I live in a repressive regime, but in exchange for this loss of freedom, you, the state, will provide for me and keep me safe. And what happened in Chernobyl is that they realized that this bargain had been broken a long time ago. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. I don't get a ton of time to watch serialized television in my life. I get home every night at 10, and then my wife Kate and I, we catch up on our days. And a lot of times my brain is so fried that I just watch NBA basketball so I don't have to think. And so I'm very late often on whatever is like a hot prestige TV drama. And that was the case for the HBO series Chernobyl, which debuted in the spring, I think, of last year and May of last year. And people were raving about it and saying how incredible it was. And I thought I should watch that. And then time went by. And finally, some point, I guess, in the fall, when I was on the road by myself in a hotel room, I watched the whole series and it was just incredible. It takes you through the disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear reactor in the Soviet Union, which is in present-day Ukraine. It's incredibly well-written, incredibly well-acted. And then afterwards, I got really obsessed and interested with uh, the actual disaster itself. And I was sort of looking online. There were some critiques about some of the kind of characterizations that happened, which is natural in any, you know, dramatization of anything. And then I remembered that I had this book I've been meaning to read that was suggested to me by an old book editor of mine. It was her husband's book. A guy named Adam Higginbottom had written a book called Midnight at Chernobyl. And so I was still thirsty for more knowledge about Chernobyl. And I read this book and it just blew my mind. It just, it's a masterpiece of nonfiction. It's an incredible look at the people involved in the Chernobyl disaster, the institutions, the socio-political context of the Soviet Union and its flaws and pathologies. It's excruciatingly well-written, humane and empathetic, but sharp-eyed. It's just an incredible book. And there's a bunch of reasons that I wanted to talk to Adam on the podcast. One of them is it's a book about Chernobyl, but it's also a book about disaster. And we see disasters happen, particularly disasters that are essentially human-made disasters, right? Like not a tsunami, but the rescue and aftermath of Katrina, the decision to launch the Challenger space shuttle, despite the engineering flaws, the financial crisis, and (laughs) which was the product of human disaster in all cases. And in some ways, I think the 2016 election in many ways, human disasters are always the product of multiple causes. A lot of things have to go wrong to get to the point where you have something as bad as the financial crisis or as Chernobyl. And as someone who covers the news and is interested in how institutions work and how people work, I'm fascinated by this. And right now, as I'm speaking to you, it is March 6th, and the coronavirus cases in the U.S. are north of 250. And there's a real sense in which the federal government response has been really bad, a real failure, has gotten us behind the curve on the virus because of a lack of sufficient testing at scale. And I fear, I hope it's not the case that we are en route to a kind of disaster here. I don't know if it is. I I think we'll be fine, but things aren't great so far. So it's a particularly good time to listen to this remarkable story about a bunch of flawed humans in a flawed system, some of them heroic, some of them less than heroic, came together and caused one of the worst disasters of the last 50 years. How did you How did you conceive of the project? Why did you want to write this book? I came to it in an incredibly lame way, which was that in 2005, I was casting about for another long narrative piece to write as a magazine story. And I was kind of stuck for ideas, so I started thinking about the oldest trick in the book. What anniversaries are coming up? Uh... So I that went, is the oldest trick in the magazine writing book. Right. So <laughs> it's just, it's, I'm ashamed to admit it. <laughs> um, but I then went to the Wikipedia calendar, and it was 2005. I was looking at stories for the coming year, trying to think ahead. Uh, so I, I was like, well, okay, so uh, 1996, let's see what was going on in 19... 19- no, nothing really there. 1986, December 19... Oh, no, I don't know. And then I, you know, came to, to April 1986. Oh, the Chernobyl accident. That's, that's quite interesting. And I had recently uh, read A Night to Remember, the Walter Lord book about the sinking of the Titanic. 
And so when I started thinking about Chernobyl, I was like, well, I could write a story that's just like the Walter Lord book, which I haven't read anywhere, which just reconstructs the night of the accident. And so that's what I eventually persuaded my editors to, to let me do after a lot of wrangling, because this is clearly going to be quite expensive. Uh, they agreed to, to fly me to Moscow and then to Kiev and, and, and to go to Chernobyl and, and interview eyewitnesses. Almost as soon as I started talking to these people, I realised, firstly, that each of them had a kind of amazing story. Uh, and that, secondly, a lot of the stuff that I'd read in the existing literature in English about the accident either missed a lot of stuff out or was wrong. So at that point, I knew that there was, you know, a book-length narrative to be written about this subject. And as soon as I came back to New York after I'd finished writing the magazine piece, I went to meet an agent. I didn't have a literary agent at the time. I went to meet this guy who shall remain nameless. And I... Uh, and <laughs> he I said, get out of here. I was just... I was so... I was filled with enthusiasm for what I recognised to be a, just a brilliant kind of epic story that would make a fantastic book. And I was not 90 seconds into my pitch and the guy's, like, eyes began to drift over my shoulder as if I was at a cocktail party and he was trying to find someone more <laughs> compelling to talk to. Uh, so that was dispiriting. And, and, I, and at that point, I gave up. It took another uh, 10 years Wow! To, to sell it as a book. So was this just sitting there in your mind or were you doing work during those 10 years? No, I, well, well, this was the other thing is that... Is that I just kind of put it on the back burner and, and forgot about it. But the story wouldn't really leave me alone. So, like, <laughs> the next time a round anniversary came up, you know, five years later, I went and did another magazine story in the exclusion zone, this time about the ecology of the exclusion zone. And then when I was there that time, I did some stupid things during the course of the reporting, exposing myself to radiation that, that made me think, this is a terrible place. And I can remember sitting in the hotel in Chernobyl, looking out of the window and saying to myself, I am never coming back to this terrible place ever again. And then four years later, I was like, hmm, I don't know, there's another. <laughs> and at that point, I thought, actually, you know what, I, I should probably just try and sell somebody on a book about this, because three magazine stories in 15 years is stupid. I thought you, I thought you were going to say that after exposing yourself to radiation, you thought to yourself, well, God damn it, I, I've got the radiation now. I better get a goddamn too, book out of it's it. It's too late now. <laughs> I better uh, get a book out of it if I'm going to if I'm going to be radiated in the exclusion zone. Well, that may also have happened, but but that was not that did not play a part. What is the exclusion zone like? Obviously, so so the after the we'll get into the actual accident, of course. But but after the accident, of course, the area is evacuated, and it, to this day, there's an enormous radius of space that right. you can't go into called the exclusion zone. What is it? What is it like as someone who's been there? Well, to begin with, I, I because I was only going there at anniversaries, um, <laughs> you know, I would always go there in the dead of winter. And under those circumstances, it's an incredibly forbidding place because you, you, know, you have to go through these checkpoints to enter it. And there's obviously no one around, but the place is blanketed in snow and there's just this kind of oppressive gray skies, you know, pressing down on this flat landscape. And there are these, you know, disused electricity transmission masts where, where the power cables long ago fell to the ground and they're just kind of marching off to the horizon. There's disused bits of wrecked equipment everywhere. And it looks like a proper you know, post-apocalyptic landscape. And it was only when I was reporting the book that I went back there in late spring, early summer, and then you go there and you visit Pripyat, the town, the Atomgrad that was built for the, everybody that worked at the station and their families. And it's, you know, it's very beautiful. It's funny. In the book, you describe Pripyat as, as this kind of almost like the countryside Catskill. There's like a stream. There's water and there's these beautiful trees. And the people that had been moved there who had... They were doing quite well in the context of the Soviet world. They, they were doing extremely well. They were well. like at the top. They had yeah. good jobs. They were living in this town where there was recreation and they could go fishing in the water. I mean, they were yeah. fishing from the water that was coming out of the cool into the reactor. So, but the fish mistaken. loved it. The yes, fish loved apparently it. they did. Um, but you, you paint this sort of – it's so funny because it, it's one of the things that strikes me in the beginning of the book as you paint the picture of what Pripyat is like. It's like it's almost weirdly idyllic, this, it, uni no, it, it this little universe wants. that gets created. Yes. And, and that was one of the things that made me really want to write the book, was that, that all the other accounts that I'd read about, about the accident 
portrayed the people who were involved there and the people that lived in the city in exactly the same way, which is this incredibly stereotypical vision of the Soviet Union, of a nation of victims who were all sort of marching in lockstep towards this doomed socialist future, like the first Apple commercial, you know, where everything's monochrome, everybody's miserable. And, you know, this played into this idea that these people who are victims of this terrible nuclear catastrophe were just experiencing a different kind of daily misery. So they were citizens of the USSR whose lives were miserable, and then they were made miserable in a different way after this reactor exploded. And again, when I started actually talking to, to people who lived there, it became clear that this wasn't true at all. And that, you know, I was 17 when the accident happened. And a lot of these guys are in their, you know, early 20s. And so really their conception of the world was not really that different from mine. They had you know, hopes and expectations and everything that were very similar to mine. And so I wanted to write a version of the story that restored agency to these people and put them in a proper context. So they weren't these, you know, stereotypical characters. It's That's what's remarkable about the book, is it is such a human story. It's an institutional story and a, and a sort of sociopolitical story, but it's a story about a bunch of people under tremendous duress making decisions and doing things sometimes that are so blinkered you want to shake them through the pages of the book, and sometimes so heroic and selfless that it feels like it's almost too courageous to be true. Right, but they, and you know, Many of them also had genuine human reactions that you or I might have had under the same circumstances. So there's one instance in which I was talking to this firefighter who was among the first responders who, who responded to the initial fire of the building on April the 26th. And the Soviet propaganda version of the, of the firefighter story is all the same. They're, you know, selfless Soviet heroes marching, f fully aware of the danger that they're involved in, marching inevitably to their deaths, but going on just like the heroes of the Second World War. And I spoke to this guy, Alexander Petrovsky, and he told me the story of being, you know, told to go up and help his friends and colleagues on the roof of the reactor block, the most dangerous place, and, and getting up there and realizing that, Everybody else had left. It was just him and his mate. And he momentarily went blind as a result of radiation exposure and just said to his colleague who he was with, let's get the out of here because <laughs> this is incredibly dangerous. Obviously, we should not be standing over this reactor. Exactly. You've got to be crazy. Let's get out of here. And, you know, that's exactly what any real person yes. would do. And so what I found is that, you know, the more people I spoke to, the more I found not these, you know, stereotypical cardboard cutout character reactions, but the reactions of people who clearly were there and had really done these things. So the Chernobyl is constructed amidst a raft of construction for nuclear power for the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. which is a big project. And one of the things that, that I thought was really interesting as a slice of life in the Soviet Union that struck me is the organizational structure of a country in which there's the government and the party in parallel structure on everything, yeah. but it's the party that calls the shots. Yes, even though, even though the, the government is ostensibly in charge. Right, yes. and yeah. that, that comes across in the book. Why does Chernobyl get built, and why does it get built the way it does at the moment it does? It gets built because uh, they wanted to bring more electricity generation to the western part of the Soviet Union. And it got built the way it did because they wanted to build nuclear power plants, but the kind of technology that was required to build the sort of nuclear power plants that we have in the West, pressurized water reactors, was beyond their manufacturing capability. So PWR reactors are a lot safer intrinsically than the graphite reactors that they ended up building at Chernobyl, but they just couldn't build enough of them because the tooling was too complex, Soviet manufacturing to cope with. Um, and indeed they did, but they were in the middle of constructing a plant that was dedicated to building these kinds of reactors, casting these globular pressure vessels that were required for the water, re water cooled reactors. But uh, Soviet industry and construction techniques and planning being what it was, the plant itself, the construction plant, uh, the atom mash plant that was uh, designed to manufacture these things itself began sinking into the swamp 
uh, on which it had been inadvertently <laughs> constructed. So, so even that didn't really work. So out. they had to abandon that, and they built these alternate. Well, t- they 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 kept building, but it wasn't very effective. Right. So but they so, built these alternate. I mean, the big takeaway I have from the book, and, yeah. it, and it comes away across also in a book I read about the Challenger disaster, is an incredibly banal but important point. It also relates to the 2016 election, which is that all disasters are by their nature a concatenation of causes, each one fairly unlikely. Yes. That's what makes a disaster a disaster. Yes. It's the normalization of deviance is what the sociologists call it. Right. And Chernobyl is one thing after another in the link of the chain that bring you to the disaster. Yeah. So there's a million, not a million, there's so many different points that you could point and say, but for that but for this decision, we wouldn't have had the disaster. And then another but for, and another but for, and another but for until you arrive at the cataclysm. Right. The first link in the chain is the decision to build these reactors that are inherently less safe but cheaper, essentially, right? And easier to build, yes. And easier to scale up. Why are they less safe? Uh, they're less safe because they're, they're inherently unstable in a way that water, water reactors like the PWR are not. So under certain circumstances, they are susceptible to runaway chain reactions, which is something that can happen inside the reactor where it simply runs out of control up to the point where it either catches fire or explodes. That you're starting at that point, and then after those first principles are taken into account, they then committed a series of design decisions which added to those initial instabilities further faults. There's a long laundry list of them, but the most frightening and most significant one in the context of the, of the Chernobyl accident is that the control rods that were designed to be put in as an emergency shutdown mechanism whenever you wanted to shut down the reactor, whether there was an emergency or not, or whether you just wanted to shut it down at the end of, for example, a safety test, could, they eventually discovered, for a few fractions of a second, increase reactivity in the core of the reactor when you inserted them instead of reducing it as it was intended to. So it's it's analogous to you're driving along the highway in a car and you stamp on the brakes because a deer leaps out in front of you. And instead of stopping, the car suddenly leaps forward and accelerates. Right, that the first microsecond, the brake actually acts as the accelerator. Yeah. And so if you're really close to something, exactly. you're going to smash into it. Yes. And in this case, you have these boron rods, right? That's the, that's the chemical. The boron is put in to absorb the electrons that are that are bouncing around. To dampen the reactivity to, of the reactor. Yeah. Right, to dampen. But they have on the tip of them this graphite, right? Yeah. And Which you, facilitates fission. Exactly. So when you pull them all the way out, the moment when the graphite tips are coming down, that graphite is actually accelerating. Yes. So you, this design flaw is discovered at some point by the engineers who work on this. At the very latest by 1983, but possibly before that. And what happens to that discovery? The engineers who discover it communicate it to their bosses in Moscow, and their bosses in Moscow say, yeah, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And and then they don't. And it's not communicated to people that this exists. Well, it kind of is communicated to people, but it's done in such a way that it's sent to, you know, the nuclear safety departments of some of these power stations, along with a thicket of other, you know, design corrections and things that you should be aware of. And as with all the other design flaws in the reactor, nobody ever pointed out to the operators the significance of any one of these problems with the reactor. So, yes, there's a problem with it, but this is the Soviet Union, and there were design faults in everything. And so people got used to working with things that they had to devise workarounds for or they knew that they didn't work properly, the technology was old. And and so this is where the normalization of deviance comes in is because, you know, it's it's part of the mythos of Chernobyl that the, the operators of the reactor, the trained nuclear engineers, were incompetent and didn't know what they were doing. That isn't true. You know, these guys are extremely highly trained. It's not just they're highly trained because they're dealing with this machinery that's a little like I had an idea. I had these flashbacks to like when you watch like a 70s movie and someone's got an old car and they're trying to get it to start. And they know like the special trick of like, come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, there it goes. Like they're even super competent in the sense that they kind of know how to like massage and manage a not super well designed machine to get it to work. Right. However, some of those tricks 
and workarounds were safety shortcuts and things that they knew that they probably shouldn't be doing. However, in the normalization of deviance, what happens is right. that you have something that, that is very risky and you do it and you get away with it. And so that seems fine. So it no longer seems risky. So then you do something else that's risky, but you also get away with that. And so you keep doing it and you keep doing it and you keep doing it. And this is exactly what happened in the Challenger disaster as well. You know, ultimately what happened is they got used to doing these things that the regulations said that you should not do. And these were regulations where, where nobody bothered pointing out the significance of each of these individual regulations. None of them said, do not do this under any circumstances, because if you do, the reactor might explode. There was no regulation written that way. So the, the operators of the reactor were simply required to follow all of the instructions. But at the same time, they were given these ridiculous deadlines. They were given these extraordinary production quotas. So in, something had to give. And this was typical throughout the Soviet workplace. And so they ended up doing these things that were dangerous. And they were inured into thinking that, you know, they were lulled into a full sense of security, that they could get away with pushing this reactor around. And it would kind of take any punishment. And then one day, you know, it turned around and bit them. So you've got this design that's suboptimal in terms of its safety. And then you've got this crucial design flaw, which is that the the sort of break glass moment when you are like, oh, Jesus, everything else has gone out the window. We need to shut the reactor down. That itself can accelerate a reaction. Right. Those two things are already in place. And then they have been putting off a safety test they're supposed to run. Right. That was supposed to be carried out when the reactor first came online at the end of 1983. So and they'd just been years. kicking the can down the road. Well, they tried doing it previously, and, and it hadn't worked. <laughs> Wait, I forgot that detail. They did the safety test, and it failed. They tried doing the safety because because, the, you know, one of the many ironies of the story is the safety test was something that was designed to test a piece of equipment that would protect the plant against a meltdown taking place in the event of a power cut, because right. the, the, the station itself did not make the electricity to run its own pumps and all the electro and keep the lights on inside the station. That's not how a power station works. It has to draw energy from the grid, electricity from the grid, in order to run the fluorescent lights in the control room and keep the pumps going. So the safety test was designed to, to use a new piece of equipment that they'd installed on the turbine generators, which could use the turbine generator's own inertial energy to keep the pumps going, to keep the water circulating in the reactor in the event of a massive power cut. Right, so they're testing for a kind of black swan scenario, exactly. which is an enormous blackout happens in Ukraine. Yes. And you want to make sure that the reactor doesn't go down. They have this new this new tool yes. that's part of the reactor that's going to use the spinning turbines to create some power, and they want to test that to see if it works, and they yeah. test it and it doesn't work. Because, you know, <laughs> God help us if the pumps should stop working for three minutes, because then we'd have a catastrophe. Right, because you've got to keep the cool water going through a reactor or it's, it melts it's down. it's long enough for the fuel to start melting down, yeah. So they do it, and it doesn't work, and so they just kind of keep putting off when they're going to do it again. It didn't generate enough electricity to keep the pumps going. So they needed to go back and, and have another go at fixing the equipment and change the voltages and, the, you know... This is now, you're now reaching the end of my <laughs> electrical knowledge. Oh, I, by the way, your electrical knowledge, at least as it, it comes across in the book, is amazing. <laughs> well, so you did a very that, good job. That's very reassuring. Of, 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 well, I know nothing. So <laughs> um, for, this, for this layman, it, I was amazingly impressed. I had a lot of help from nuclear engineers in, in those parts of the book, definitely. But yeah, so that was the idea. It was a safety test that, that was designed to protect against a blackout. So on this night, the fateful night, they're going to run the safety test, and they're running it at shift change, right? Well, you know, one element of this long chain of unlikely events is that the test was supposed to have been conducted in the afternoon by a totally different shift of people. But what happened is that they were reaching the end of the month, and the way the Soviet workplace worked is that everybody had end-of-month production quotas. But people would show up to work at the beginning of the month, drunk or not at all, and just not really, you know, put their 
much effort into it, really. So, so they would wait until the end of the month, and then they'd have this what they called Sturm period, when they would like storm towards their <laughs> goals, and everybody would work round the clock and use an enormous amount of electricity to stamp out tractor parts, or whatever it was. It's ba- basically a um, an entire planned economy operating on the college term paper. Approach. <laughs> yes, it is. Like, like. Oh, it's due in two weeks. Oh, it's due in a week. Holy shit, it's due in seventy-two hours. I have ninety cups of coffee, and I'm writing this thing. Exactly. And so, what happened is, we're approaching the end of April, and then more than that, you've got the May Day holidays coming immediately after the twenty-sixth of April. So, the grid controller from the um, central grid in Kiev refuses to give them permission to conduct the test because it requires the test requires them to take the reactor offline. And he's like, we can't spare the power. We got right. canning factories that have exactly. to hit their quota. Yes. So they say, the grid controller says, you can't conduct this test until later today, nine o'clock at the earliest. And then that kicks the test back into the night shift. And the night shift are not the group of operators in the control room who've been preparing to do this test. So there's a day shift that thought that when they went to work that day, they were doing the test. Yeah. But instead, what happens is a night shift shows up and it is sprung upon them. Yes. That they're going to do the test. Yes. So, I mean, again, normalization of deviance. We're now like we've gone through a bunch of the chains. So then they start to do the test. What's I forget the name of the engineer who's sort of the one kind of driving them to do the test that Dyatlov. night. Dyatlov. Dyatlov, yes. yes. Who becomes kind of one of the villains in the s- sort of internal Soviet propaganda about what went wrong. Yes, he does. And in the TV show where he's sort of portrayed... He, he's, in, in, in the TV show, he's the most villainous. He's the, he's, the, he's the one with, like, the thin mustache who's chain-smoking, right? Yes. Well, it's funny you mentioned the mustache because, because I kept thinking that he was going to nip out of the control room at some point to start waxing the ends of it, put on a <laughs> stovepipe hat and tie a woman to the railroad tracks. Yes, and, he has, yes, he is the only one in the whole thing that has that kind of like cartoonishly villainous vibe. Yes, maybe. Yes, but, but maybe definitely. some others, but he's the most sort of yeah. monochromatic in that yes. way. But he is, Dyatlov is the guy who, it's sort of his control room. Right. Well, he's running the test. Right. Yes, exactly. And so, and he's got, I mean, God, the human drama here of just like, it's the, so he's got some engineer who's sitting there. Two engineers. These yeah. two engineers. These, and these guys, you, you talk about them in the book. And again, do this amazing job of sort of opening up their inner lives. Like, they're kind of sitting on top of the world. They're 24 or 25. They've had, they're engineers and they've got these plum ass jobs. Right. They're like, they're, and they got their own apartments, which is not a thing that most people were Absolutely in not. In the Soviet Union have. They've got this sweet job. They're like young men on the make living right. in this like idyllic town. And they're going to sit at this reactor with their boss over their shoulder and run this test. And they don't really want to do it because they think that the circumstances are not optimum. Uh, but he insists. Yeah, this is one of those moments of sort of real human drama I kept thinking about it as I was reading it. It's, it. it's portrayed in the series, too, but as I was reading the book about... It's an imperfect analogy, but, of course, like the Nuremberg standard, right, about, like, following an illegal order, about which is sort of the highest level at which a person has the courage or fortitude or ability to say no right. to someone above you who is telling you to do something, in the case of Nuremberg, obviously, like commit a moral atrocity. In this case, it's like, eh, this seems a little risky. But it's that question of, like, can you stand up to the boss? Well, the other thing to bear in mind is that, that and, and again, this, this goes back to some of the mythos of the story, is that, you know, previously Dyatlov has been portrayed as someone who, who didn't necessarily really know what he was doing and didn't really understand how his reactors worked. But that's not true at all. He was regarded as an absolute expert because he was. He was a pure physicist who'd, who'd had decades of experience working with nuclear reactors. And so, you know, the younger members of the staff may not have liked him. In fact, but many they looked, people they respected him. detested him. But yes, they respected him. And they respected his opinion. And so, you know, if Dyatlov said it was okay to do something, then whatever misgivings you had, you might well think that you should just do it because he was right. And also part of, of what we're leaving out here is that the, you know, reactor had become, had fallen into an unstable state, partly because these guys made a mistake. Um, Leonid Toptonov made a mistake when he first got to the desk. So the reactor began losing power. 
and reached a point where all of the regulations said that you should just shut it down. And that would be the end of it. There would be no test. It was due for maintenance. The reactor would be shut down and it would be offline for, you know, a month or six weeks while it was it, the work was done on it for the maintenance. And then, you know, they could do the test in another couple of years, which was absolutely what Dyatlov did not want to have happen. So it wasn't as if they were sort of blamelessly sitting there and saying, right. this is, you know, uh, Comrade Dyatlov, you put this reactor into a in a state that we think it is unwise to proceed with the test. They themselves, or Toptonov himself, had overseen this mistake. So they start to do the test, and as they're moving through the test, they're essentially losing control of the reactor. Yes, they are, uh, but they're not really aware of the extent to which they're losing control of the reactor, because things are happening. In so, I mean, part of the, the reason for the instability of this, this model of reactor, the RPMK, uh, is that it's absolutely massive. It's 20 times by volume uh, larger than the kind of reactors that were being built in the West at that time. And this means that inside it, one of the, the nuclear engineers who worked with them described it as, as um, resulting in, in series of hot, hot and cold spots inside the reactor core, as if it was a giant apartment building where in one apartment somebody was celebrating a wedding and then across the hall somebody was celebrating or marking a funeral. And so what was happening deep inside the reactor quite often they couldn't be quite certain of. So they were aware that things were not optimal but they didn't realise how not optimal they were. They run the test and the test takes 36 seconds and at the end of the test they say okay the test is complete let's shut the reactor down. And the mechanism for shutting the reactor down is to press the AZ-5 emergency shutdown button. That's just, that's what you do to shut the reactor down. And so these emergency control rods begin descending into the reactor. But what has happened is that there is already a runaway reaction building inside the bottom of the core of the reactor. And there is no instrumentation indicating that this is happening. Right. So there's no panic. I think probably, again, you know, this is the, the mythic version of the accident, and I think probably what's portrayed in the TV show, although I can't remember, is that is that it's, you know, this extremely sort of dramatic China syndrome-style moment where... Right, where some, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Where and there's all these, there, there are all these, like, alarms going off and, and, and the reactor's clearly running out of control and somebody screams, press the emergency shutdown button! And somebody leaps across the control room and slams their hand on the button and then, you know, a massive explosion is used. But actually what happened, as I discovered during my reporting, is, is what to me seemed much worse than that, which is that nobody's talking... Everything's calm. Akimov says, shut the, the test is complete. Shut the reactor down. AZ-5. So he presses the button. And he presses the button, and then after that happens, suddenly all these warning buzzers and, and annunciator alarms begin going off. And then they're like, what? But at that point, there's nothing else they can do. They're powerless to stop whatever is happening. Right, because they, happening. they've hit the kill switch. Exactly. There's no other kill switch. Yeah. So then the explosion happens. Yes. And one of the things that's so striking is that people can't make sense how long it takes to make sense of what has happened. Right. To conceive of what's happened. It, it, it's like this... You have this incredibly complex system that has been derailed through a series of incredibly complex steps that have brought you to this place. And now you're faced with something that is a mystery to you that you can't figure out. Well, it's something that, that nobody really thought was possible. I would be interested to know how common this is in this kind of context of a, of a massive cataclysm like this, where... I think people just experience some sort of psychological break, which is certainly what happened with individuals who are involved in this one, which is that despite the fact that they can see what's happened with their own eyes, their brains kind of refuse to process it because it's so far outside their realm of experience, expectations, and they don't want it to have happened. And, I, you know, I think that's, that's what happened. So for hours, uh, Viktor Brahanov, the director of the station, is simply denying that what has happened has happened. And indeed, there's, there's, there's one case of, uh, of the leader of the nuclear emergencies response team who flies down from Moscow, who the following afternoon is flying over the reactor building in a helicopter 
and looks down into the reactor building, and he can see that the top of the reactor has been torn away by this massive explosion. But he wrote in his memoirs that, that even then he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He had to force himself to comprehend what his eyes told him he was seeing. So that, that's the kind of key moment there. And I want to talk about what happens after the disaster next. What is the aftermath like in those first 24 hours, 48, 72 hours? Well, I mean, the, the first responders from the fire stations near the plant and the operators from within the plant are the people who, you know, bear the, the brunt of what happens. So these people are, are people who take enormous exposure to radiation, are exposed to scalding radioactive steam. But because they... The, the, and the people who deal with most of the problems are the operators inside the reactor building, not the, the firefighters. The firefighters are dealing with, dealing with what's happening outside. But the guys who really are, ex, you know exposing themselves to extraordinary danger, and knowingly so, are the people who work inside the plant. They're the ones who, who become very gravely injured. And it's not until probably six or seven in the morning that the authorities say, actually, you know what, let's not send any more people in to try and deal with this. How does it make its way up the chain of the Soviet bureaucracy? That's a very complicated question. <laughs> I mean, because I guess this... it's a very complicated question because it gets to this question of how it gets to a broader sociological and philosophical question about how states manage disasters, particularly how a closed state, right, right that it manages a disaster, which is particularly, I think, germane right now. Uh, uh, yeah, vis -vis indeed. China and, and coronavirus. And, uh, and indeed the United States. Yeah, you're right. But, but what happens initially is that this sort of, on one hand, denial of reality and, on the other hand, genuine uncertainty about what has happened plays into the way information goes up the chain. Because Bruhanov is told to file a report about what has happened. He's the plant director. The plant director. And he delivers this report, which simply reports that everything's under control, really. And they take radiation readings, and there are radiation readings taken by the plant's head of civil defense, who uses a military radiometer, and is absolutely terrified by the readings that he sees. But every time he comes back to Bruhanov to tell him that there are these extraordinary radiation fields around the plant, and indeed, right outside the entrance to the bunker where they're all sitting and making these telephone calls, Brahanov tells him that, that his instrument must be broken. And shut up. Go away. Leave me alone. I have, these, I have the, the plant dosimetrist. He will go and take reliable readings. He is an expert, a man who knows what he's doing. This guy goes off and comes back and tells Brahanov what he wants to hear. He tells him that, uh, that the readings are high, but, you know, within the realms of, of reasonable tolerance for a nuclear accident at a nuclear power plant, and that we don't need to be that worried. But what he doesn't say to Brahanov, and what Brahanov doesn't put in his report when he reports these figures, is that the figures that he gives him are the maximum readings for the equipment that he's using to do his measurements with. So, just to be clear, he's got a scale that, say, goes 1 to 10. Yeah. And he's coming back and saying, it's, it's a 10. And Vorobiov, the civil defense guy, has a military radiometer, which goes up to, like, 200 roger an hour. And his instrument is also maxing out. But Brahanov insists that that one is broken, whereas the one that goes up to 10 is telling us that the reading is 10. So he puts this in the report, and then this report goes to Moscow. And, you know... To, to be fair to the Soviet accident response, they've already got people coming down from Moscow. You know, early in the morning, they're flying down to go and find out what's going on and organize the response. But at the same time, this single sheet report by Bruhanov is wending its way through the Soviet bureaucracy in Moscow. And ultimately, you know, later that afternoon, finds its way onto Gorbachev's desk. What Brahanov's report says, just, you know, if you're in the Soviet Union, this is just sort of par for the course industrial right. accident. Stuff burns down, planes crash. We blew out a tire. Yes, exactly. And, you know, some people, have, a couple of people are missing. There are definitely 
radiological injuries, but it's, it's, it's under control. You just said something that, to me, gets at the kind of core question about this, about both the cause and then the response, right? Which is like, how much is this a product of the distinctness of the system that produced it? And how much is it a thing that happens in complex systems and bureaucracies? Like, I feel like, I mean, I guess it's a little bit of both, but there's some kind of way in which we've come to understand it as a, a particular disaster born of the failures of Soviet communism. Well, I would, I would say that that is exactly what it is. It's hard to imagine this accident happening in any other political system. And it was a uniquely Soviet disaster. Yeah. Because, you, you, as you say, you've got all of these elements of, of the disaster that have been building for, for years, if not decades, before it actually happens. And the bureaucracy, and it's specifically the parallel system of government you, talk, you talked about earlier, about having the government and the party, it's just making a mess of everything at every step. Um, those things are, are what made the accident happen in the way that it did. And certainly, the, it, it's hard to imagine the kind of denial and reluctance to admit bad news which is something that's central to the way the Soviet system worked, um, happening anywhere else. What was the cost of that denial? It was denial really combined with the confusion that, that meant that they didn't immediately respond in the way that they could have done, which resulted in people being sent into dangerous areas unnecessarily and then delaying the evacuation of Pripyat, of the Atomgrad, which is only three kilometers away from the plant, because they didn't want to admit to the wider world what was going on. I mean, after that, I think the denial is, becomes less corrosive, but what happened in the first 36 or 48 hours is definitely all a result of that. What is the scale of the deaths that result from it? It's sort of hard, it's, it's amazing how hard it is to pinpoint that number. It is hard to pinpoint that number because, firstly, they covered up, the Soviets covered up a lot of medical information that they gathered around the accident. And it's complicated by the fact that the epidemiology of radiation exposure is extremely complex. So even if you had the data, it would be quite hard to figure it out because there aren't really, with the exception of thyroid cancer, which we can speak about in very specific terms and very specific numbers, uh, it's very hard to connect radiation exposure directly to any given cancer, particularly wow. given the extremely high background rate of cancer in, in the general population. So it, it's, it's the signal from noise is, is very difficult to pick out. But what I would say is that, that you know, this is a, a question that's often raised about Chernobyl, but I think that it's I mean, it's not unimportant, but I, but I think that it's kind of missing the point because what's undeniable is that, you know, tens of thousands of people's health was ruined by radiation exposure, by the results of this accident. Hundreds of thousands of people's lives were uprooted and turned around and were never the same again as a result of what happened. And so we don't know whether... I mean, the best estimates are really of around... 10,000 deaths, estimated deaths, that may happen over the course of 25 years as a result of radiation exposure caused by this accident. But then you're talking about that in a population of 5 million people in the worst affected areas, Belarus, Ukraine, and the Russian Republic. So, you know, 10,000 people out of 5 million, you can see that like this statistically, right. this is extremely hard to pick out. But my point really is, is that, you know, to focus on the deaths, which people are understandably interested in, is sort of missing the point because it's, it's undeniable that there were many, many, many people whose lives never recovered from this. And they became sick and they suffered from different cancers, they different illnesses that may or no, may not be linked directly to radiation, but, you know, are definitely linked to the accident in some way. It's a profound moment of trauma and disruption for the entire society. Yes, and and remains so to this day. Right? Does it? Certainly in Ukraine, yeah, and Belarus, I think. Yeah, it gave me a, a sense of that because it's, you know, when you're in the world of it, here's Ukraine, part of the Soviet Union. It's like going from Texas to Oklahoma, 
Now that's not the case. <laughs> and in but, fact, that's quite a contested thing. And then when you think about, right, so the history here, which is already a loaded history before Chernobyl, obviously, between right. the Russians and Ukrainians, like there's this very recent in- insane trauma of the Russian Soviet government administering a system that created this disaster in the midst of Ukraine. Although, you know, in in the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, Chernobyl was used as a as a political weapon by Yeltsin as, a, as an anti-Soviet device, which is partly why a lot of the documents that were released that were declassified about this accident in the first place came out because uh, Yeltsin wanted to use the way in which the... Soviet state had failed in its duty of care to the population as evidence in a, in putting the Communist Party on trial. Right. And so these documents were released as part of that effort. So initially it was a it was an anti-Soviet thing. Now it's you know the the conflict between Ukraine and Russia which as you say has has a, a long long history. This is simply one part of that. Right now there's um the coronavirus uh news and there's a famous book by a academic named called James Scott called Seeing Like a State, which is about the ways that states marshal information, right? what they see and what they don't see. And there's a recent piece by this academic Zainab Tufekci in The Atlantic about coronavirus in China, where she kind of makes the argument that, that this is kind of China's Chernobyl in some ways, mm-hmm. that the blind spots of the system and the bureaucracy were what allowed the disease to spread in that society before they could essentially in some ways confront their own denial about what was happening. Right. And she basically makes the argument that transparency and free flow of information is the fundamental means by which you deal with disaster. Right. What do you think of that? I mean, I've thought about the the coronavirus in this context because um, actually, somebody asked me to write a similar piece about whether or not this was China's Chernobyl. And the, the interesting thing about what happened in the Soviet Union is that it was the way in which Chernobyl contributed to the Soviet collapse was partly due to transparency that Gorbachev introduced in the aftermath of the accident. So although there was growing distrust, of a, there was existing distrust of official information, and growing distrust of the state as a result of the accident. It was only after he opened the zone for more open and honest reporting that people got a real glimpse of exactly how badly they'd been misled about what had happened. So I think that's a, that's a sort of that's one of the things that makes what's going on in China quite different from the Soviet scenario because huh. they sort of because Gorbachev kind of voluntarily uh, lit the blue touch paper in the Chernobyl case. Because he, after Chernobyl, pushed for some transparency. Yes, exactly. And, and I think, you know, the, the, in the initial liquidation, the cleanup and the disaster response, you know, the Soviet state actually made things possible in, in disaster response that would not have been possible in a democracy. Because it was only because of the fact that it was this enormous planned centralized economy that they were able to deliver, you know, all of the lead ingots in the Western Soviet Union right. to, to Chernobyl in less than 24 hours. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do that in the United States because you'd have individual business managers saying, I'm not going to do that until you pay me. Right. Um, but, they, you know, but the, they were able to, to marshal these enormous resources very, very quickly because of the centralized state. And so, you know, obviously, and that, there's a parallel there in China, because in some ways what, what, what has happened in China is that the, the initial part, I think, of the virus spreading and then being slow to deal with it is born of the repressiveness of the regime, but also the insane quarantine that they put, the lockdown that they have put on parts of Wuhan and other parts in the country is you could only really do in a state like China. Right. But I think that the, the, the core similarity is the same bargain that the Soviet people struck with the Communist Party that the people of China have struck with the Communist Party there, which is, yes, I recognize that I live in a repressive regime, but in exchange for this loss of freedom, you, the state, will provide for me and keep me safe. And what happened in Chernobyl is that they realized that this bargain had been broken 
a long time ago. And that seems to be a similar thing that's happening in China now. Adam Higginbottom is the author of Midnight in Chernobyl, the untold story of the world's greatest nuclear disaster. It is, as I probably said in the introduction, a genuine masterpiece of nonfiction writing. It's, it's an exquisite book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, my great thanks to Adam Higginbottom. He's an author and writer for The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Wired, GQ, and Smithsonian. The book is called Midnight in Chernobyl, The Untold Story of the World's Greatest Nuclear Disaster. You should definitely check it out. It's a fantastic book and a very good read. As always, we'd love to hear your feedback. You can tweet us with the hashtag withpod, email us withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. 